which is behind these indices, it's it's usually about vertebrates. Yeah, so this these are the taxa which have been considered for calculating the index. A lot of fish, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, not a single plant or insect. <laughs> yeah, so a similar picture when you look at the IUCN Red List Index, which is a very important measure for measuring the progress towards the targets of the Convention of Biodiversity, uh, you see there's a, a trend for birds, mammals, amphibians. Well, oh, there's also corals and cycads, but not, not a single insect taxon, which is considered here. And also, if we look at the Global IPBES report, it's a very similar uh, picture. Actually, they calculated this number of 1 million threatened species in 2019, which you may have heard of. And this is a calculation they made. So they looked at the ice and red list status and they said uh, among plants and all animals except insects, the number of threatened species is about 25%. And then they used just the estimated species number of, uh, yeah, of, of the Morad al paper. Uh, so 2.5 million species of plants and non-insect animals exist. So the estimated number of threatened species would be 0 0.5 million. And for the insects, they did the same calculation, but they said, well, we only take 10% threatened here because we do not have good data, in fact. Yeah, so the data was not so good. So they did a more conservative uh, um, assessment. And uh, the, the only data they had at hand were the European red lists for dragonflies and number of dragonfly species which are threatened is, is apparently lower than in other insect taxa. And also for wild bees, where there were a lot of data deficient species. So uh, they used these 10% and came with this calculation of 1 million. Well, a few years ago, we made a short overview, a paper in, in conservation biology, where we looked at the number of species listed or assessed for the ISN red list. And you can see that the percentage on the, on the left for birds, mammals, amphibian reptiles, and fish is quite high. While for plants, invertebrates, and fungi, it, it is quite low. And also on the right hand, you see the data deficient species, so where not enough data is available to do a red list assessment. And of course, the invertebrates have the highest number of data deficient species. So there's, there's huge data gaps, of course, existing for these taxa, which, which, which hamper also the red list assessments a little bit. Now, I made an update of this graph just a few weeks ago for the, for another talk, and I found, well, it has changed a little bit, the picture, but <laughs> mainly in the vertebrate groups. If I just go back one slide and go forward again, just look and on, on the left part of, of the graph. So that was the situation in 2021, and that is the situation now. So birds, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and even fish are nearly completely assessed. Plants have increased a little bit, but invertebrates and fungi are still very, very little represented in the ice and red list. And the number of data deficient species still is the highest in invertebrates. Well, we have made some progress with the ice and red list. I started with the grasshopper specialist group in 2010. In 2013, I became the chair of the Invertebrate Conservation Committee. And you see, since that time, we have really made a lot of progress. We have, meanwhile, 27,000 species uh, on the ISN Red List, invertebrate species. I usually talk about invertebrates because um, I'm, I'm chair of the Invertebrate Conservation Committee. And of course, a vast number of, of insects and invertebrates. But uh, well, we cannot make groups for all the other non-insect yeah, arthropods or mollusks or whatever. Anyway, so you see 27,000. This is about 2% of the known invertebrate species, not about, not talking about the non-described species. Yeah, so it's it's still a very, very low proportion, but it's increasing a little bit, but it always depends on funding. Most of this work is voluntary, so people can submit red list assessments if they want. But as soon as funding is available, we see a little bit more progress because then there is also a, a mandatory uh, targets and deliveries. If we look at the status on the ice and red list of these invertebrates so far, you can see that about one quarter is in fact threatened. So it's very similar to the other taxa. So it's a little bit surprising that IPES used a lower number. But of course, this is not a random sample. So sometimes people prioritize species which are threatened, uh, while um, in, in the taxa which have been globally assessed, like the amphibians and, and mammals and so on, 
um, we know, of course, the exact proportion of species which are threatened. A few weeks ago, we published a paper where we changed the picture a little bit, and you may have come across one of these headlines that now 2 million species are threatened with extinction and not 1 million species. And the reason behind it was that we actually yeah, repeated the calculation by IPUS based on better data. And we used the European red lists again, because for European red lists, we have meanwhile quite a few uh, insect and also other invertebrate taxa which have been assessed. And you can see in this graph, so the, the, the red and orange and yellow colors are threatened species here. You can see that in the, in the invertebrates, and the proportion of threatened species is actually not lower than invertebrates. And it's also uh, about the same level as in plants. So it's it's actually not so drastically different. And I think we cannot expect something different, yeah, because the impact of humans on all biota should be more or less the same, yeah. So there's no reason to to think about something else. But we see also again a number, a high number of of data deficient species, and these need to be excluded here because we don't know whether they are threatened or not. So we come actually to the same, um, more or less the same number of, of threatened species. So for the insects, we in fact have twenty four percent threatened species, and if we use this calculation again similar to what IPES has done, we come to a different number of about 2 million species. We have a standard error here, so we made a little bit more um, complicated calculation <laughs> compared to what IPES did, because of course the, the, the estimated species numbers are also not exact. Yeah, so this uh, shows that actually insects are as highly threatened as other taxa. And this is quite interesting because um, I got a lot of feedback from journalists who said, what can we do about it? And that's an important question we have to ask. What can we do about it? If we look at the uh, the IUCN red list, there's also very uh, good tools for analysis of several things. So you have to uh, classify, for example, the threats. Yeah. So you have to fill a certain standardized classification schemes for threats, for habitats, and so on. And this helps you, of course, to analyze the data. And these are the threats for uh, the different taxa and for all species. And you can see for vertebrates, for example, biological resource use is the highest threat. And this is mainly because of overfishing. Uh, while in invertebrates, agriculture is actually the highest threat and similar to plants. And agriculture doesn't mean agriculture itself because this is European species, many of which are adapted to agricultural land use. But it, it's more about the changes, the rapid changes of agriculture. Yeah, the, the larger machines, the larger fields, um, lack of uh, hedgerows and uh, pesticides, fertilizers, and so on. Um, now, talking a little bit about the ISIN, um itself. So the ISN is a complicated structure. It's actually not a typical NGO. It's, it's very old, very influential, founded in 1948. And it has uh, more than 1,300 member organizations. So they are not, not individual members of IUCN. They are member organizations like states, for example. Germany, where I'm based, um, is actually a, a member of the IUCN. So when the states are a member, the conservation agencies are usually members of the IUCN, but also a lot of NGOs. And this is so interesting about this uh, platform because it brings together the non-governmental and governmental organizations. Um, also, well, probably you know some of these NGOs like WWF, the British Ecological Society, some zoos are also a member of the ICN. ICN has a secretariat with 1,000 full-time staff in 60 countries and 45 regional offices. And the headquarter is in Glan, Switzerland, not far away from the UN headquarter because uh, well, not the headquarter, but the, one of the UN um, um, quarters, um, it's because it has official observer status at the UN General Assembly. And this is very unique because there's only one other organization which has such a status, this International Red Cross. And this is why they are so influential in the policy world. Yeah, So they have drafted the CBD, the Convention for Biodiversity, for example. 
And of course, IUCN is known for its knowledge products, uh, the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, World Database on Protected Areas, a Global species, Invasive Species Database, and so on. So a lot of standards have been, um, uh, and also guidelines like reintroduction guidelines, uh, which are usually very, very useful for conservation projects. Every four years, there is a World Conservation Congress. The next one will be in the UAE in 2025. And uh, during, uh, for, well, these, these four years are called Quatrenia, and, and all the planning of, of actions in the ISN are actually framed uh, in, in, in these Quatrenia. Yeah, the two most important people in the ISN are currently the President Razan Al Mubarak from the UAE and the Director General Greta Aguilar. And the good thing about uh, Razan Al Mubarak, she has really a very strong species conservation focus. And she really cares about the little things. Yeah, I have seen her in discussions. She's really good also talking about small beetles and so on. Well, this was the official structure of the ISN. And then there is, well, also part of the official structure, but these are the so-called commissions, which is an, a network of voluntary members. And there are more than 70,000 experts which are in these commissions. There are meanwhile seven commissions. The Climate Crisis Commission is quite new. So actually this uh, the numbers shown here are just for the other six. And you can see that about 10,000 uh, members are in the Species Survival Commission. And this is uh, the, the commission where I'm also working with. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, <laughs> working at the Natural History Museum in Luxembourg, but uh, I'm, I'm doing voluntary work for the SSC. And the SSC is, uh, has a chair, which is uh, Jean-Paul Rodriguez. Uh, Jean-Paul Rodriguez is also a head of uh, an NGO in Venezuela. And I think he made his PhD even about tiger beetles. Uh, so he has some uh, tiger beetle background, or maybe it was his master thesis, I don't know. But anyway, so he, he, he is also quite interested in diversifying IACN because there used to be a strong focus on mammals and birds in history and and he's very supportive of new groups uh, covering other taxa. The deputy chair is Rima Javado. She is uh, based in the UAE and she is uh, a yeah, more marine person, maybe working for shark conservation and so on. And then there's a steering committee which meets one or two times per year, uh, which I'm also a part of because I'm chairing the Invertebrate Conservation Committee. So the committees, are uh, more an, an overarching body, which are somehow trying to coordinate what the specialist groups are doing or trying to establish new specialist groups and so on. And the specialist groups are the working units, more or less, in the SSC. Um, we have uh, five different structures. Yeah, the one, one structure are task forces. Task forces have a very clear product to deliver. They have also, uh, or I think it still exists, the task force for systemic pesticides, for example, delivered a couple of reviews to uh, uh, about uh, the, the impact of the systemic pesticides on, in, on insects. Then there are red list authorities. Red list authorities are only doing red list assessments or coordinating red list assessments. There's one called TIRLA, which is, means Terrestrial Invertebrate Red List Authority. And this authority covers all taxa which are not covered by specialist groups. And usually they try to organize also the, some people working on different taxa, and sometimes these become also later specialist groups. A new structure is national species specialist groups because ISN found out that there are some countries where there are not, not a lot of NGOs and the people who would like to do some on, about conservation uh, are not well well organized or connected. So they, they found these specialist groups uh, like the Chinese species specialist group, which is the logo below. Then we have the taxonomic specialist groups like the grasshopper specialist group, which also I chair. And then the thematic specialist group, there's one on invasive species, one on conservation genetics, uh, climate change, conservation planning, and so on. And this is just a list of the existing invertebrate specialist group in the IECN. When I started with the grasshopper specialist group in 2010, there were only four groups which existed. One for mollusks, one for corals, one for dragonflies, and uh, there was a, another one, a, crust a freshwater crustacean specialist group. Those were the four groups which existed in 2010. 
And you can see the, the list has become quite long now. Still, we have a lot of gaps, yeah, because this is just an overview of the uh, coverage of different invertebrate taxa. Everything what is read here is covered, but you can see the very large white sections for the beetles, uh, the dipterans, the bugs, uh, hemipterans, and large parts of the hymenoptera, particularly the wasp. Uh, we have a wild bee specialist group, but the, but and an ant specialist group, but not not the wasp. And of course, we try to fill these gaps because we are, we are really keen to get get, uh, get a good representation of as many taxa as possible in the IUCN because this will increase the voice for insect conservation. There are some new specialist groups which are currently under formation or under discussion, I must say, because not all of these discussions are successful. I had a, I had a lot of discussions in the last years with people whether they could start in the new specialist group, but it always depends on the one champion who really would like to take it and, and to write a proposal and really lead such a group. Uh, for example, uh, Benjamin Haring from the Tierpark Bern, which is a small zoo in Switzerland, uh, does a lot of captive breeding for stack beetles and, and other beetles. And he said, well, he would like to actually start a stack beetle specialist group. And so we try to connect him also with other people. There's a nice colophon uh, conservation project in South Africa, for example, and, and getting people from all over the world working with stack beetles. And we usually start with a Zoom meeting just to discuss what could be the remit of the group, what could be targets and who would lead it and so on. Another one is a termite specialist group by Andrew Davis, uh, then the tiger beetle specialist group that was mean was was uh, also discussed with David and and very nicely and David Pearson also a water bear specialist group and a woodlouse specialist group or not insects but anyway still invertebrates and yeah we will see where where these end and when they start uh, and usually as I said it depends very much on the one person who would like to chair it one problem we usually have is increasing diversity. If you look at the list, yeah, there's Switzerland, USA, 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 Germany, USA, Belgium. Okay, it's all about Western Europe and North America. And this is how, where we usually find the, the, the majority of experts on insects. And so it's very difficult to increase diversity also in, in uh, the leadership of the groups. So what is needed? for founding a new specialist group. Uh, we first need a group of people who would like to do it, and then they have to write a proposal. And there are a couple of questions which need to be answered. And the first question is, what are the key conservation issues for the group which should be covered? And uh, this is usually not problematic because people who have expertise on these taxa, of course, know the key conservation issues. The second question is, what is the tax? Uh, why, why is this taxonomic level useful, and doesn't it overlap with other groups? For the stack beetle specialist group, for example, we we are still under discussion whether whether it would be better to have a separate cytic beetle specialist group or a stack beetle specialist group. Yeah, you see, it's it's a little bit difficult sometimes to decide because it depends on how the experts are usually organized yeah so in in the grasshopper specialist group we usually we also cover uh, mantises and uh, and phasmids for example um but it but it always depends a little bit on the structure of of the existing organizations a third question is whether there is a clear gap for the group to fill this is usually not problematic because yeah we have a lot of gaps concerning insect conservation so the third first three questions are actually just short texts about why, why they are important. And then we come to the more complicated things. Uh, the fourth point is about the key activities or outputs of the group. And this means you should propose some targets for the next years. And usually you would, for example, make very specific targets like delivering 50 red list assessments of, let's say, Indian tiger beetles until 2025 or something like that. Yeah, so smart targets. Uh, or, yeah, developing a conservation action plan for a critically endangered species or whatever. So a couple of targets need to be uh, agreed upon with the membership of the group. The fifth question is, is there a unique core group of relevant experts willing to dedicate energy and time? 
which means you should in advance meet with with people who would like to join the group and have their consent to to add them to the list and this list should also be delivered together with a complete proposal so and this list should be diverse again yeah so it should not be only about uh, taxonomists, uh, it, it, it's good if they are also ecologists or even people from the conservation world, which no, do not need to be scientists. Yeah, For example, in the grasshopper specialist group, I have also members who are protected area managers, who are uh, working in zoos, who have not really a, a strong specialization on orthoptera, but they bring other skills to the group, yeah, like captive breeding or management of, of protected areas or whatever. The sixth question is the most important one. Is clear leadership available, which means you need to find a chair of the group, or you can also propose two co-chairs. I told you that it's always difficult to increase diversity, and this is something where the steering committee, which has to review this proposal, uh, looks at it quite, quite, uh, yeah, drastically. <laughs> so they they really want to get rid of old white man or at least reduce their proportion uh, in the leadership and so what we usually propose is two co-chairs and maybe one of them is an expert from north america with a very a good connection connected um, or uh, good connections to to the other leaders um and the other one may be um for coming from a developing country or it could be someone who has better skills in protected area management or somebody uh well or female or whatever yeah so trying to to increase diversity by by co-chairing is, is something which works if we find the one co-chair who is female from a developing country and willing to to lead the group that is of course fine but the the thing is the most important is that this person is really uh, willing to dedicate energy and time. Yeah, and, and this is really, really important. Um, there's also a third role. Um, so if we have two co-chairs, it's a third role. It's at the so-called red list authority coordinator. And the red list coordinator is somebody who has to revise or review all the red list assessments which are processed by the group. Yeah, or somebody who has a good oversight of what's going on concerning red listing. It's a person who will be the contact person for the IUCN red list unit. Yeah, and the final question is, is there any institutional source for support, which means is your organization where you're working with uh, willing to support you if you do work voluntary for the IUCN? And actually for academics, it's not so complicated. Yeah, I've worked for, uh, yeah, I was, I'm still a professor at a, at a university here in Germany, uh, but I'm I'm now uh, at, at the Natural History Museum. But I found that many of the targets we have in the specialist groups align very well to my research profile. Yeah, so I can sometimes send students to a conservation project so that they, for example, uh, yeah, collect data, which is important for the conservation project, but also for their thesis, and maybe that and also later for a paper. Yeah, so it actually works quite well together. But of course, if we have somebody who would like to chair a group, but he doesn't have a job or she, and then it's it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, then because how how would you organize it if you don't really have something? Yeah, um, let's say permanent uh, a permanent standing somewhere. Well, increasing diversity, just to show you a graph, this is the SSC membership in terms of the so-called ICN regions. And you can see Western Europe is dominating the area. South and East Asia are well represented in North America and the Caribbean as well. And of course, we have very short uh, comings in, in Africa and West Asia, Oceania and so on. So it's, um, it's, it's good to reach out to people in other areas. They exist and they may not have the uh, a strong uh, background, but they need it, yeah, and they need these connections, and it's it it really helps also to start conservation projects in these areas, which are often more biodiversity rich than Western Europe or North America, uh, and of course, gender and skills, as I said, is also important to increase the uh, diversity of skills, and not only think about taxonomists of of your taxon you're covering, but also about any other people who could help um, to, to deliver the targets of the group. 
Well, all the targets are aligned in, this, uh, in the five components of the species conservation cycle of the SSC. The first is assessment. Assessment means red list assessments, but also key biodiversity areas or green status assessments or whatever. Uh, then planning, conservation planning. Uh, we have delivered a couple of conservation plans in the last years. I will show you a little bit um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, conservation action. And this is something important because the current chair of the SSC would like to push the specialist groups more from assessment and planning to conservation action. Because there was a tradition of the, particularly the old groups, to assess the species, so the red list status, and deliver action plans and then reassess and replan and assess again, but not go into conservation action. And this connection must be made. Uh, so now there is, I think, it has already improved a little bit. Um, then there's a network, which means uh, that, that, of course, you should enhance the, the SSC network within your group, but also with other SSC groups and communicate, which means you can, for example, have newsletters or websites or whatever you, you would like to create. Just to show you a little bit about uh, this uh, one project, which which is one one of my favorite projects, uh, the Crow Plain Grasshopper, because it, it explains a little bit what we have done in the Grasshopper Specialist Group. I was contacted in 2012 by a protected area manager in southern France, and and he was aware that in his area, the Crow Plain, uh, this uh, grasshopper occurred, which is endemic to the region. And he had no grasshopper background at all. Yeah, so he he actually was before that he was uh, managing a reintroduction of wild horses in Asia, something completely different. And he said, well, apparently this grasshopper is is disappearing even in the protected area, and we need to do something about it. So he contacted us, and the first thing we did is uh, doing a red list assessment, and it turned out to be critically endangered. And then I sent some students there to collect some basic data uh, about the population status and so on. And in 2014, we organized a workshop to develop a conservation strategy. And you can see there is a wide um, representation of people. There is, for example, somebody from the French army, because part of the uh, site is owned by the French army. And that was actually nice because uh, the, the, this area was under threat because the French army planned uh, new weapon stores in this area. And during the workshop, he, he declared that they will not do it, which is, of course, fine. Maybe they probably had other, <laughs> other reasons for that. But anyway, um, and then uh, a few years later, the conservation uh, planning guidelines were published. And you can see the, the crow plane grasshopper is also on the title of this, uh, of this booklet because it became a little bit more standard for, for insect conservation planning. And part of the plan is uh, ex situ conservation. So we are working together with a zoo in Tori. And you can see the insects mating and all positing, But we had really problems to get uh, the nymphs hatching. So we moved to the field and then started with in situ captive breeding, which worked much better. And next, well, this year, we will probably have the first translocation of uh, or reintroduction of insects uh, to a site which was formerly um, yeah, occupied by the species. One problem was also the monitoring because this species is very cryptic. There's one insect on this <laughs> on this slide, and I don't know if anybody can find it. I mean, you're all entomologists; you should have the skills. <clears throat> but the problem with this grasshopper is he, he it's not singing, and it's usually not jumping. It's 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 behaving like a stone. Yeah, it it jumps like a stone even. It, it uh, and it, actually it's here. Yeah, so. Um, this means uh, it's really difficult to find and difficult to count because the recapture probability is very, very low. And as I said, well, they are sometimes singing, but not as a as a normal song, as a typical grasshoppers. Apparently, they are singing after mating, but anyway. And uh, I had a PhD student who worked in this project, and she uh, optimized the monitoring prot protocol and found out that the capture probability is highest about 10 days after the first adult emergence. Yeah, so when you start 10 days after first adult emergence, you get much better data for population modeling. And we also trained detection dogs to find the grasshopper, which worked very well, I must say. And so they really can distinguish grasshopper species yeah, by, by their uh, smell. 
And we also studied, of course, the reason why this species disappeared. I mean, it was a protected area, so we were a little bit surprised that it's disappearing in a protected area. So we compared the three existing, still existing populations with those which have disappeared and looked for the vegetation changes in the area. And you can see the white columns here are the formerly, formerly occupied sites, while the black ones are still occupied. And you can see that the vegetation is denser and higher in the area which is still occupied. So apparently grazing of sheep could be one issue. So what we proposed is to exclude one area which was particularly low in population size from grazing. And this is this area. You can see there's a fence here and you can see already the change in the vegetation. And as a result of this, the population of the grasshopper increased dramatically. So during the first year in 2015, we had only, I think, 38 individuals left. And actually, this uh, graph should be continued. And last year, we made the last census. We are, have now about 700. So it was really a successful project. So to sum up, the bottom line is, well, if you would like to start an SSC specialist group, just contact us. And of course, there are some benefits. First of all, your taxonomic group will receive more attention by conservationists and in conservation policy. Second thing is that generally the coverage of insects on the red list will increase. The third thing is that we will also have increased conservation action for those neglected threatened insects because a lot of species just go extinct because nobody knows about them. Uh, we will reduce the loss of insect diversity, hopefully. And of course, it will give you also very good collaboration opportunities with non-scientists, which is can, can be very fruitful, in fact. And of course, generally, they are, the network opportunities are very good, also with IUCN members, other IUCN specialist groups. You get contact to people which have very good expertise in conservation breeding or conservation genetics or whatever. And of course, there's also an international reputation as a member or chair of a specialist group in the IUCN. And finally, there are also fundraising opportunities, but IUCN is not a funding organization. Yeah, they, they have to <laughs> raise their funds themselves. So the chair of the SSC has to raise funds for his job. But of course, uh, the title as an S IUCN member can help you to uh, yeah, get better funding opportunities. And there are also, meanwhile, small internal grants available to reach the targets. Yeah, just small amounts of about $3,000, but this can sometimes help to fund a student to do some red list assessments or whatever. Okay, so thank you for attention. I'm happy to discuss this with you.